Okay, so this is part two of uh, contemplative science. Uh, um, we're just going over, the last one kind of just cut off, I forgot that, you know, it's only ten minutes. But, um, yeah, so we're going over in substrate consciousness, how um, there are certain claims that all contemplative uh, traditions have found after meditating and quieting the mind. And these certain, uh, I guess you could say, realizations about the, the nature of consciousness um, may very well help uh, cognitive scientists uh, head in the right direction. So what we're saying basically is that we're able to, uh, through the practice, the rigorous and pragmatic practice of meditation and certain rules and guidelines that it has to help quiet the mind, um, serves as sort of a beacon to, stay, to steer clear away from, you know, fallible judgments and interpretations and stay in this more objective, pure, um, I guess you could say, awareness that is meditation. So it, it kind of clears the lens of bias and, and, and it kind of creates as, as much as possible an objective inner science. And because of this, because we're exploring this inner dimension, I mean, to put it in a fun way, we're actually sort of becoming uh, cosmologists of the inner universe. Um, we're becoming uh, cosmonauts, in a sense. We're exploring the mind, and we're exploring the inner world of who we are, which is intricately connected to the outer world. But nonetheless, we were in, sort of like inner cosmonauts. Uh, and I know, I know a lot of the uh, the more entheogenic, I think it's called, practices. See, you know, using um, hallucinogens and psychoactives as means to do this, but just as much. Um, if not more, is meditation a practice to help because it, it allows the self to kind of grow into these higher realms without the need of, um, not, not that it's wrong, but it helps allow such, such explosive contemplative psychoactive experiences and help, helps them become traits. It helps, so I guess you can see the psychoactive is blasting you into the universe of the inner world, right? But meditation is sort of a way to kind of gradually emerge into the universe. So, I mean, it's good to blow your mind and get out there and see what's out there and really help you begin to evolve. They're catalysts, I guess you could say. But just as much as the shaman is a cosmonaut, so is the meditator. Um, so that's just, just putting that out there. Um, so there's a principle of conservation of consciousness that manifests, and by the way, we're reading B. Allen Wallace, just going over a few points that he mentions in the book. So, um, so yeah, according, there's a principle of conservation of consciousness that manifests in every moment of experience. Uh, the material constituents of the brain, such as neurons and electrochemical processes, do not transform into immaterial mental phenomena. So he's saying, basically, um, that... Consciousness does not emerge from the brain. Consciousness is something greater than the brain, but the brain is able to sort of tap into that, in a sense, kind of bring it down and mold it according to the way the brain is set up. So it's sort of like taking that pure light, bringing it down, and the brain sort of is like a set of mirrors or crystals or diamonds that reflect and fragment the light and create and generate the experience of human experience. But the good news is, even though we're kind of stuck in this, you know, specific shape or molding of light or, or awareness, ana analogously, um, we can still um, sort of reverse that process and see its roots in this greater light, uh, this greater awareness, this primordial isness, um, which is an interesting theory, and. Other things happen when you do this, when you go into this. Um, but anyway, uh, no patterns of uh, neuronal events actually become mental events, uh, nor do mental phenomena emerge from nothing. Rather, this empty, luminous substrate consciousness transforms into mental images, discursive thoughts, perceptions, emotions, and so on. In the course of a human life, these mental events are conditioned by the brain and the environment, but they emerge and dissolve back into the substrate consciousness, this greater light beingness. Likewise, these mental events influence the brain, body, and the physical environment, but they do not transform into those physical phenomena. So, in short, he's saying, 
from this Buddhist perspective, the hard problem of how the brain produces subjective mental experience is a false problem because it doesn't produce those subjective mental experiences. Um, and the explanatory gap in demonstrating how some kinds of neural activity can be equivalent to mental events is unbridgeable, for neural and mental events are never identical. Now, it seems at first that he's implying a dualism here, something that Descartes was saying. Um, this sort of, you know, there's consciousness and then there's the physical. There's the physical and there's the mental. But I think Buddhists are saying something slightly different, not the physical and the mental, but there is consciousness and it's permeating this this great grounding of consciousness is permeating all things and out of it arises the mental which it can permeate into as well so it's saying i guess i guess it it's not truly a dualist perspective because even physical phenomena are mere manifestations of this grounding of primordial awareness so it kind of creates this great circle and this great this great um cyclical nature of philosophy that says there is you know from emptiness become, comes form and that's sort of like one of the great teachings in the mystical traditions and the contemplative practices emptiness is form form is emptiness so this is much different than the dualist philosophy almost like you know these two these two things are running parallel to each other forever mental and physical it's not saying that it's sort of a cyclical um harmony of mental phenomena um and physical phenomena ar both arising from primordial awareness um so yeah, he, he also mentions vacuum or substrate consciousness, which he's calling it. Um, oh, let's see, is a relative vacuum state, voided of all kinetic energy, of active thoughts, mental imagery, sense percep perceptions, quieting the mind allows us to be to tap into that. But uh, generally speaking, it is indiscernible while the mind is active. It normally manifests only in dreamless sleep and at death. Um, while substrate consciousness is depicted as the natural, unencumbered state of the mind, its innate radiance of purity are present, are present even when the mind is obscured by afflictive thoughts and emotions. When it rests, it is luminous and empty, but when catalyzed by thoughts of sensory stimulation, it is potential energy. Um, its potential energy transforms into kinetic energy of the psyche, manifesting all kinds of mental imagery. So the potentials manifest and become the actions. And, and that goes for the action being, you know, this planet, or the action being this mental phenomena. Um, so, it's very interesting. Now, another, the more mystical aspects that emerge from this, such as, um, let's see, this dimension of individual consciousness transcends the specific qualities and limitations of the personal history in this lifetime, gender, and even species, and the substrate underlies all forms of consciousness. Um, human and non-human, which is interesting. Does that mean that, you know, my pet frog o over there has this substrate consciousness? Does it have the sense of I-ness that obviously the mental phenomena is molded differently? It's fr it come, the light, you know, consciousness is molded differently in its mind. You know, maybe it just has a sense of I-ness, but it doesn't have a sense of, um, you know, feeling an emotional complex thought. It's just simply I-ness and instinct, you know? But, um... And it's very interesting to think about. I mean, the implication of that is quite amazing. Maybe there's I-ness in everything, and it's just molded into different ways, you know. But, um, which is what they're saying, too. But, uh, yeah, contemplative's mind is subtle and silent, luminous awareness. Um, it's able to po possibly have direct attention to the past, bring consciousness, distinct detailed memories of events that occurred years earlier in this lifetime or before. So it's saying this grounding of consciousness allows us to tap into um, the experience of other beings, actually, which implies that maybe there's another fragmentation that's slightly higher called the soul, or as Ken Wilber says, um, you know, not just, you know, non-dual or causal awareness, but then there's also, like, this, the, the, the soul and then the psyche, and we're kind of tapping to both of them, but the soul is something that exists a little bit, um, has some vague form that exists over lifetimes. Um, so I think I'm going to go into that into the next video because that's interesting in and of itself. But let me end here. If you have questions, comments, critiques, uh, please make a response video and uh, we'll, we'll talk about it.